In this next segment, we're going to put you on the couch, the couch of Dr. Guy Winch. Our next speaker, please welcome to Guy Winch. <laughs> Dr. Winch is a licensed psychologist and an author whose books have been translated into eight languages. His most recent book, Emotional First Aid, Practical Strategies for Treating Failure, Rejection, Guilt, and Every Other Di Psychological Injuries, we have it. It's available. I highly recommend it. He's going to be signing copies afterwards. His uh, prior book is The Squeaky Wheel, Complaining the Right Way to Get Results, Improve Your Relationships, and Enhance Self-Esteem. It was published in 2011. Dr. Winch received his doctorate in clinical psychology from New York University in 1991, completed his postdoctoral fellowship in family and couples therapy at NYU Medical Center. He's been working with individuals, couples, and families in his private practice in Manhattan since 1992. He's a member of the American Psychological Association. And he uh, has a very popular blog on psychologytoday.com called the Squeaky Wheel Blog. He is uh, a blogger for a number of outfits such as Huffington Post. It is my pleasure to welcome him today. Please welcome Dr. Guy Winch. First of all, thank you, uh, Jeff. Can you hear me well, everyone in the back? Great. Yes, exactly. So first of all, thank you very much for Jeff and everyone for giving me such a warm welcome. This is my first time at this uh, conference. It's not some of your first times, but you've been very welcoming, very warm, and uh, thank you for that. But coincidentally, um, a funny thing happened on my way here last night. Um, but really a funny thing. I was at the airport and I bumped into an acquaintance of mine who's a corporate lawyer. I haven't seen him for maybe 18 months. The last time I did see him, he was telling me that he has bad genetics because look, I have no body fat, but my cholesterol is 300 and something, whatever, it was bad. Um, and I hadn't seen him since then. So I bumped into him, I said, oh, how are you? How's your health? And he said, Great, my cholesterol is down below 200, it was like 180 something. I'm like, wow, that's amazing, how did you do that? He's all vegan. So I said, well, funny you should mention, because I'm on my way to give a talk at the Healthy Lifestyle Expo. And he said to me, really? I thought you were a psychologist. <laughs> and he did look perplexed, like, what does psychology have to do with the health lifestyle? You just couldn't see the connection. And many people don't see the connection. And so I hope this evening I'll be able to demonstrate a little bit of that connection, because they are kind of related. Um, but the thing is that there is a huge divide between how we think of our physical health and how we think of our psychological health. You know, it's not uncommon to say to someone, how's your health? when you see them. Now I want to ask you, have any of you bumped into someone you haven't seen and said, how's your psychological health? <laughs> no, because they'd look at you like, excuse me? Like, what are you calling me crazy? It, it's not something we would ask, but why? Why wouldn't we ask that? Now, I sometimes do, I can get away with it because people know I'm a psychologist and the response I get, what, what do people say? They go, oh, um, <laughs> I, I don't know, you tell me. A, I can't tell them, and B, they don't know. And that's the problem. There is this huge divide. When it comes to our physical health, we might have disagreements, and sometimes profound ones, about diet, about a certain practice, or a certain recommendation. But we do kind of agree on basics. You know, people know what you mean when they say, how's your health? They know what you mean when you talk about being healthy. That whole concept is kind of clear to them. It's not clear. I mean, if I asked you, well, what is psychological health? It's very hard for you to define well, what that actually means. What is that? You know, when you see somebody who has an injury that's physical, you can tell, oh, look, you're bleeding from your elbow, you must have fallen. Or you're limping, you must have sprained your leg. Or that's a cough and a sniffle, you probably have a cold. It's not that difficult for you to determine that. And when it happens to you, you know what to do about it. You know that if you're bleeding, you need to clean the wound and apply some ointment and a band-aid. And if you sprained your leg, you should probably stay off it so it doesn't get worse. And if you have a cold, you should rest, etc., etc. You know how to deal with those 
those kinds of things. But we don't have even the basics when it comes to our psychological health. And even professionals often don't even have the basics. We don't know what that does. Now, here's the thing. We sustain psychological injuries like failure, like rejection, like guilt, loneliness, brooding and rumination, loss and trauma, bouts of low self-esteem. We sustain those kinds of injuries just as frequently, if not more frequently, than we do physical ones like cuts and scrapes and sprains and colds. So they happen to us all the time. But when they do, we don't have any clue sometimes that we're even injured. So there is this big divide. And I want to make this comparison a little bit more specific. When it comes to physical injuries, we have the basic awareness. We know that we have to monitor our physical health. We have to monitor our bodies. We're aware that's something we need to be thinking about. We don't even have the basic awareness that we need to be thinking about our psychological health. We're that far behind in terms of that uh, catch-up. We know when we're injured, you know, when, when you uh, fall off a bike, or wipe out on your skateboard, because you look like a skateboarding crowd. But when that happens, you know, you check yourself for injury. It's the first thing, ooh, what did I do? But when we sustain a psychological injury, when we have a big blow that happens to us, we don't know how to check ourselves for other kinds of injuries. We don't know how to assess what went wrong and, and, and what we might be suffering from. We don't even have that basic ability. We know that physical injuries require treatment so they don't get worse, right? We know that the cut can become infected. We know that the cold can turn into a pneumonia if we don't do something about it. But we don't know how psychological injuries get worse, in what manner that would happen, what kind of injuries get worse, and how that happens, why that would happen, to whom that would happen. We don't know those kinds of things. And lastly, we know how to treat basic physical injuries, right? We all have a medicine cabinet at home or a little kit with our ointments and our, and our bandages and our, uh, you know, all the different uh, pain pills or whatever it is, you know, we, we have in there so that when daily things happen to us, we can take some kind of action. But we don't have a kit for psychological injuries. We don't know how to treat any of them, really. And so there is a huge, huge uh, divide. And the thing is, it's not just our physical bodies that we prioritize in this way. It's our teeth as well. Because if we look at dental hygiene, you know, we know that our teeth need constant care. We are aware of that. We, we brush and we floss to prevent cavities. It's a daily practice. We all do in the morning, in the evening. We're very aware of it. We take action if we feel pain so the problem doesn't get worse. You have a cavity, you feel pain, let me go to the dentist. I'd rather the cavity than the root canal if I don't take care of it. And, and we teach our children to, I say, love their teeth, but to take care of their teeth, right? You know, how old is a child before they start brushing? When they can stand up, pretty much. And what is the psychological equivalent of brushing and flossing that we practice as adults, let alone teach our children, there is none. We put more care, just think of the irony, not irony, but just think about this. We, we put more care into our teeth than we do into our psychological health. And I think there's something wrong about that, not because I'm against teeth. I, you know, I, I have a vaguely British accent, but I'm actually all for good teeth. You know, I'm, <laughs> it's true. I don't resent the American Dental Association. I don't. I have teeth. I'm for teeth. I love them. But there is a strange favoritism that we have when it comes to our physical health and our teeth, which makes them like the, the, the stepsisters in the Cinderella story that get all the love and all the care and all the attention while our psychological health is as neglected and as marginalized and as ignored as Cinderella to left to, to sweep the floors with the mice and the birds. <laughs> it's very difficult to find a picture that depicts psychological health, you see. So I, I use Freud because, you see, there's the cigar. All right. So you get my point. So look, our psychological health is important in and of itself. 
uh, obviously. But it's also important because it has a really big impact on our physical health. And as you'll see, some of the ways our psychological health impacts our physical health are going to be quite surprising to you, I would uh, like to wager. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. What happens to us when we sustain psychological injuries? What can we do about them? But I'm also going to tell you a little bit about the science. A, because you understand science, um, and B, because I think it's important to flesh out what psychologists do. We're talking about things like rejection or, or guilt. These are experiences. These are emotions. You can't grow them in a Petri dish. So how do you study them? How do you recreate them so that you can examine them? So I'm going to uh, uh, pull back the veil and show you some of those secrets, just so that you understand the mechanisms, and it'll also help you understand what actually happens to us when we experience those kinds of things. And I'm going to start with the most common psychological injury that we do sustain in our daily lives, and that is rejection. I call rejection the emotional cuts and scrapes of daily life because they are that common. I know me, I can't put my hand into my pocket without nicking something on my finger. I'm a bleeder. I'm constantly, something's happening. But rejections are like that. You know, we, we get dropped by our dates and our, our, our partners don't respond to our sexual advances and our friends snub us and our neighbors don't invite us to their barbecues and our colleagues go out to lunch without us. Oh, and now we have a whole new arena of rejection, which in my office, in my private practice, I hear about all the time social media. Because I liked every one of her vacation shots on Facebook and I put mine up and she didn't like mine. Or I tweeted everything the guy said, but I put something so important on Twitter and and they didn't tweet it back. Or, I'm unemployed, and they know it, and I'm trying to connect on LinkedIn, and they won't connect with me. People actually experience these things, and there's nothing wrong with them that they do, and you probably do as well, as hurtful, as rejecting. And if you think, you know, you just get rejected when you actually meet people, well, now you have hundreds of friends that can reject you at any moment by not <laughs> responding to the things that you value, that you put up there. Look at my child. No, really? No one's going to like that picture? It's a baby. What's wrong with you? So, if you think back on a time where you felt rejected, maybe when you last checked your Facebook page, you'll realize that all rejections have one thing in common. They hurt. Hurt feelings is the word we associate, the term we associate with rejections. And what's interesting is that that term, hurt feelings, is really similar in almost every single language. In almost every single language, we refer to what happens to us as a result of rejection as hurt feelings, as emotional pain. It's universal. And so scientists, when they wanted to study rejection, what they wanted to study first was why does it hurt so much? But how do you study rejection? If you really want to understand it, you have to kind of catch it in action. How do you do that? You can't drag your research assistant down to the local singles bar and go, look, that dude just got shot down. Quick, give him the questionnaire. Come on. You can't. I'm sure they tried it, but it, no, it doesn't. Anyway, so how do they do it? Well, here's what they do. Imagine you sign up for an experiment, and you show up, and you're in the waiting room, and there are two other people in the waiting room, and you're waiting to be called for your experiment. And one of the people sees a ball on the table, and they grab the ball, and they toss it to the next person. And that person grabs the ball, and they toss it to you. And you take the ball, and you toss it back to the first person, and now you have a game going, and the first person tosses it to the second person, and the second person doesn't toss it to you, tosses it back to the first person who tosses it to the second person, back to the first, excluding you from the game. At which point, the researcher, coincidentally, comes out of the room and says, we're ready for you, come right in. <laughs> now, how would you feel in that scenario? When I ask that question to most people, they say to me, two strangers didn't toss me a ball in a waiting room. I'll live. I don't care. But it turns out, we care very much, because that experiment has been done dozens 
and dozens of times. And what we find consistently is that people report feeling a lot of emotional pain after being rejected in the waiting room by the two strangers. And not just emotional pain. What they report is that their mood drops, their self-esteem takes a blow, they feel angry, and they feel aggressive afterwards. And so researchers are really interested by this. Wow, so people really get their feelings hurt by these two strangers. I mean, as far as rejections go, this is on the small scale of things, obviously, but it still really hurts. So researchers said, well, all right, what if we're being rejected by people we don't even really like? What would happen then? So they ran the experiment again, and they, people got rejected, and they brought them in, and they said, you know, those two people in the waiting room, they're here for a different kind of experiment in social attitudes. They're members of the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> Klan members. So they're the ones that didn't toss you the ball. Now how do you feel? And people said, yeah, that still kind of hurts. <laughs> Even when we actually don't like the people who are rejecting us, it still hurts. So then the researcher said, let's try this. They ran it again. Brought people in and said, we're coming clean. Those two people in the waiting room, research confederates. It wasn't real, they were following a script, all is forgiven. Now how do you feel? It still hurt. So now researchers are thinking, my goodness, what is happening in our brain when we get rejected? How is it that it hurts so much, even when we're told it wasn't real? It doesn't happen with any other emotion. How is that possible? And so they put people in functional MRI machines, which are brain scans that you can actually look at people doing certain puzzles or thinking things. You can see what happens when they're doing a certain thing. Here's who they recruited for this study. They asked for people who had experienced a recent, extremely hurtful romantic rejection. And they had them lie in the functional MRI machines looking at a large picture of the person who broke their heart while reliving the conversation in which it happened. <laughs> when I saw this study, I had to look it up, because usually you see summaries, because I wanted to see the methods section, because I was desperate to know how much were they paid, you know. Um, because <laughs> Because usually, here's $5, thank you very much. But no, it was actually a decent amount of money, as it should be. But what they found was really, really shocking. Because they found that when we get rejected, the same area of our brain lights up and gets activated as gets activated when we experience physical pain. In other words, the areas in our brain responsible for rejection piggyback on the pathways responsible for physical pain. That's why it hurts. That's why telling yourself, well, I don't like them or it wasn't real, doesn't help. Because if you fall and you stub your toe, telling yourself I shouldn't have done it, doesn't help. And so it's a really fascinating thing. They really were amazed. And then the researchers said, well, if it's that close, if it mimics physical pain so closely, we could just give people Tylenol. And so they did. They ran the ball tossing experiment again and gave half the people Tylenol and half the people sugar pills. And the people who got Tylenol reported feeling less emotional pain, unaware that they got Tylenol, than the people who didn't. Now, I am not suggesting you pack Tylenol with you when you go on a date. <laughs> a, because it's a little pessimistic, don't you think? But B, because the fact that it makes statistical significance doesn't mean that's really going to help you when your heart's torn out. Um, but still, the thing that was interesting is, why is it like that? It doesn't happen with another emotion. What is it that made rejection so powerful in our brains? And here's the theory. In our evolutionary past, when we were hunter-gatherers living in tribes, then the price of um, exclusion, the price of being ostracized 
from the tribe was pretty much a death sentence. You couldn't survive alone. We were in small bands. You needed to have the tribe around you. You needed to be sitting around the hearth and the fire at night with other people. And so people developed an early warning mechanism that alerted them as to when they were at risk for getting uh, thrown out of the tribe for being ostracized, and that was rejection. And it had an evolutionary advantage, because the more painful you experienced rejection to be, the more likely you were to correct your behavior, not get thrown out of the tribe, and live to pass along your genes. So over generations, uh, rejection became more and more painful. And that's the legacy that we live with today. And you see that legacy in the fact that even small rejections hurt, and even when we're told we weren't actually rejected, it hurt. And you see that legacy even in our expressions. Because imagine the tribe sitting around the hearth and the excluded person out in the cold. Those are the expressions we use to describe rejection. She gave me the cold shoulder. They froze me out of the group. Yes? And so researchers were interested about that expression. They did another experiment. They divided subjects into two groups. And one group, they said, we want you to think about an experience you had in which you felt really included. And the other group, they said, we'd like you to think about an experience in which you felt rejected. And then they said to them, by the way, we've had problems with maintenance, and they've asked us to ask people to estimate the temperature of the room. And the subjects who had gotten rejected estimated the temperature in the room, on average, to be three degrees colder than the subjects who felt included, just by the memory. The memory alone made them estimate the room as being three degrees colder. And then the scientists thought, hmm, let's see how far this goes. And so they transferred the ball tossing experiment to an online version where you sit with a computer and you're told that two other people are in other rooms and you're tossing the ball and getting excluded. And what they did there is they hooked up people's fingers to a temperature gauge, only they told them they're measuring heart rate or something. But they were measuring temperature. And the people who got excluded from the online version of the ball tossing game registered an average drop of temperature in their actual skin of almost a full degree. In their actual skin, again, by being rejected by two strangers they can't even see while playing a computerized version of a ball tossing experiment. And then they did another thing. They rigged the computer to have a glitch and they happened to have an assistant standing by, and the people said, oh, my, my computer's malfunctioning, and the assistant was, happened to be holding either a cold or a hot cup of tea. And they said, just hold my cup, and I'll fix it. And they found that the people who got rejected, who held warm tea, and who warmed their fingers, then reported less emotional pain than the people who held the cold cup of tea. In other words, even warming our fingers then warms our heart. So that link between mind and body is much more substantial than we tend to think. And it operates in all kinds of ways we really would never imagine, and most of which we are entirely unaware of, like in this instant of rejection. So let's look um, at another example of a psychological injury that will demonstrate this even more. Loneliness. I consider loneliness to be relationship muscle weakness, uh, and I will explain why in just a moment. But first, let's define it. What is loneliness? Well, loneliness can only be defined by you. It's subjective. It's not about a quantity of friendships. It's not an external standard. It's whether you feel either emotionally or socially disconnected. There are many people who report feeling very, very lonely who are married but they are disconnected emotionally from their spouse, and so they can feel very lonely. Some people have tons of friends, but none of them feel that close, and so they seem like these popular people, but they feel very lonely. And other people might live alone and just have a couple of friends, but they're not lonely. So it's very much a subjective standard. Now, we know that 40% of people will experience loneliness in their lifetimes when they go away to college, say, and leave home, when they're in the army and they serve overseas, when they move to a new neighborhood or a new state or a new country, um, when they get divorced, 
when they get older and their friends start dying around them. There are all kinds of circumstances that will do it. But it's not just the circumstances. We know, for example, in the most recent census, which was 2010, I think, you know, the category of households there, there's two-parent households, single-parent households, multi-family households, two parents, two couples living alone. The biggest category now that was not the biggest category previously is households with one person, 27% of the people. So. Again, which is not to say those people are lonely, because it is a subjective standard. But here's what happens to us psychologically when we get alone. We develop relationship muscle weakness, because the skills that we need to create deep bonds and deep relationships, skills like empathy or perspective taking, um, skills we need to be in public, our social skills, our conversational skills, we start to lose them. We're not using them as much. And like any other muscle, relationships muscles will atrophy when we don't use them. The problem is that psychologically, when people are lonely, they develop a whole way of thinking that is very, very self-defeating. They are unaware that they are doing something very crucial. And what they're doing, unfortunately, is un in an unconscious way, they are pushing away the very people who could alleviate their loneliness by their behavior. Because they feel so raw, and they feel so vulnerable, and they want to be protective. They don't want to put themselves out there and experience rejection. So if a friend hasn't spoken to them for a month, they'll call the friend and they might write call or email the friend and go, you know, you haven't called me in a month. Now the friend is there thinking, you haven't called me either, but you sound angry, so not very appetizing for me. You know, or I'm not going to go to that party because I don't know anyone and, and no one will want to talk to me, so they'll avoid going. Or I'll go to that party even though I know no one will want to talk to me. So off they go to the party and they're so convinced no one will want to talk to them that they park themselves by the hummus and the vegetable dip with a scowl on their face and lo and behold, not very inviting for other people to go up and go, hey, what's with the salpas? You know, and then they feel, see, I'm undesirable. People didn't want me. And they misunderstand it. Now, if you have the flu and you're home in bed for a week and you get out of bed and your legs wobble because your muscles are weak, you will conclude, my muscles are weak because I haven't used them in a week, correct? But when you're lonely and you haven't dated for three years and you go out on a date and you screw it up and the person's not interested, unfortunately, you don't conclude, my relationship, my dating muscles are weak. You conclude, you see, I knew it, I'm undesirable. And so there's a real big misinterpretation that happens. And the defensiveness and the, and the, you know, the, the, the need to protect makes people literally push away and they're not aware of it. And, and also, lonely people don't see the opportunities that exist around them. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was doing this radio show on NPR, it was a call-in show, and these days, call-in shows, you can call in, but also you can leave questions on the show's Facebook page. And we were talking about loneliness. And one man, and they were reading me the questions, and one man wrote on the show's Facebook page, along with dozens of other people who wrote questions, and what he wrote was, the doctor doesn't understand that people like me don't have opportunities to connect with people who feel like me. Well. You, there are dozens of them right there on the page. You have your name, you have their name, just click friend. How can you not see that? But, but that's what they wrote and they were indignant that I wasn't getting it. After I actually made that point. And that's the blindness that happens to us when we suffer from loneliness. And the problem with chronic loneliness in that sense is it's really a trap that's difficult to get out of. It stigmatizes us. People are aware when somebody is lonely. And there are other studies, and this is a little alarming, that show that loneliness is even contagious in social networks. They followed a big social network of people. They identified within it the people that were lonely, and they followed them over six and nine and 12 months. And they saw that in time, the lonely people were pushed to the periphery of the social network, but the people closest to them were also pushed out to the periphery of the social network. So there's a certain even contagion that can happen. When people come to see me in my office, one of the things they're most reluctant to admit 
is that they're lonely. They will tell me things you wouldn't believe before they tell me they're lonely. And I'm like, really? That you could tell me? Which kind of, I'm having a hard time getting the visual out of my head, but this you can't tell me? <laughs> so, anywho. Um, so, loneliness can really impact us. And psychologically, it sets us up to be more at risk for depression. We are at greater risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. We are at greater risk for the progression of Alzheimer's to be more rapid. But other than that, loneliness affects us physically as well. The constant stress we feel makes us at much greater risk for cardiovascular disease when we are chronically lonely. And the other thing loneliness does is it depresses the function of our immune system. And you don't have to be lonely for that long for that to happen. They did one study where they looked at college freshmen just after they arrived. And you know, health services, they asked, oh, here's a flu shot. They gave everyone a flu shot. And they asked them a bunch of questions. It's a kind of standard uh, thing. And they, one of the questions was, are you feeling lonely? And they saw that the students who indicated they were lonely had a much poorer response to the flu shot than the students who didn't feel lonely because it was depressing their immune system, even in the short amount of time they were at college. And when you look at people's health factors and you compare people with similar health factors, health risk factors, who are lonely, who are chronically lonely rather, and who are not, you will see that the chronically lonely people live less longer. It literally affects longevity. And so scientists concluded that taking all of this into account, Chronic loneliness poses a significant a risk for our physical health and our longevity as cigarette smoking. As cigarette smoking. Now look, cigarette packs come with warnings from the Surgeon General. Doing this might kind of kill you. But loneliness doesn't. When we inhale two packs a day of loneliness, we don't know that we're doing something that can be that damaging, not just to our emotional health, but to our longevity that we're really predisposing ourselves for all kinds of diseases because of the chronic stress, because of the depression of our immune systems. And so the awareness, again, I'm going back to that um, point, that our lack of awareness when it comes to our psychological health is really costing us. And look, you are people who are really informed about nutrition. You're really informed about physical health. And you see around you people who are not. And you look at them and you go, eek, what you're doing is costing you and you don't realizing it. Well, that's everyone when it comes to psychological health. Everyone. Let's look at another example of a psychological injury, brooding and rumination, which I say is like picking at emotional scabs. Now look, it's natural to reflect about distressing or upsetting experiences when we have them. It's a natural thing. You know, the people can really go over in their minds about the breakup, or you know, your, your boss yelled at you in a meeting in front of everyone, and you were really, really upset about it, and so you stew about it, and so you think about it. But the problem is, sometimes you get stuck, and you can't stop thinking about it. And then the next day you're thinking about it, and then on the weekend you're calling all your friends, to, and then this happened, and he said this, and it was so embarrassing, and you keep thinking about it, and you see the boss's face, and you relive what happened over and over and over again, and then you start introducing fantasy versions. There's the heroic version, where you, you imagine yourself that you, know, you stood up to the boss, and you screamed back, and everyone applauded, and they carried you out on their shoulders, and it was terrific. And then you have you know, like the victim version, where you broke down crying in that version after the boss yells, at you, and the boss realizes he was a real schmuck, and so he says, I'm so sorry, and he learns his lesson, or you have the tragic version where you stood up to the boss, but then you got fired, and then you lost your job, and now you're homeless and living on the streets. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's the same initial thing over and over and over and over in your head. And people will sometimes come to me, and they'll want to talk about the same thing for months on end, and they'll say to me, when I object, they'll say to me, but, but it was only three months ago, and you know, you're a psychologist. You should be thrilled that I'm expressing my feelings. And I'm like, well, I'm actually not thrilled. This is not my thrilled face, because <laughs> there is a big difference, which I really want you to understand as a result of this, between adaptive, useful, healthy self-reflection and maladaptive, not useful, unhealthy self-reflection. Let's look at the difference. It's a really important thing. When you're self-reflecting in a way that's adaptive, 
that's useful. The goal of it is to ease your emotional distress. That's what should happen. What should happen is that when you then think of the upsetting or distressing event, it has less emotional potency. That's the goal, right? Now, why does it have less emotional potency? Because you are gaining new insights and fresh perspectives, and you're learning things. You're realizing, for example, hmm, now that I think about it, before the boss yelled at me, they made that suggestion which I criticized in front of everyone, so kind of, I stepped on their toes, which is why they stepped on my toes. Lesson learned, don't criticize the boss in a meeting. You learn that. Or you talk to colleagues who say, you know, the boss is always really difficult with new hires, but then they get to like you, so it's just getting through the first few months and you realize, okay. Or they tell you the boss actually has an anger management issue and this is going to be bad for a long time and you feel, you know what, I'm going straight to human resources and seeing if I can transfer. You figure out what you need to do. You figure out any action you need to take, you get a new understanding of it, you get a fresh perspective of it, and once you get it, once you, okay, I figured that out, you can move on. And it eases the tension, it eases the stress, it eases the distress once you figure it out. So that's what happened when your self-reflection is adaptive. Here's what happened when it's not. When self-reflection is maladaptive, then we just replay the same events over and over and over again. There is no insight. There is no learning. There is no fresh perspective. We're just replaying it. But each time we do, we're getting more upset, we're getting more angry, we're getting more sad. We are just increasing our emotional distress. You know, we used to think, Oh, we know it's a catharsis, right? They're just telling people about it is cathartic, right? I'm used to say, oh, like if you're angry, punch a pillow. Who, who's heard of the punch a pillow theory, right? Now, oh, there was a movie a while ago with, with uh, Robert De Niro and Billy Crystal analyzed this. And, and Billy Crystal, a while ago, meaning like 20 years, but you know, Billy Crystal <laughs> plays a psychiatrist and Robert De Niro uh, plays a, a mobster with anger management issues. And he's sitting in the session and Billy Crystal says, well, if you feel so angry, you can punch the pillow. And Robert De Niro goes, okay, takes out a gun and shoots the pillow three times. And Billy Crystal is all alone, and he go, uh, feel better? And Robert De Niro goes, yeah, yeah, I do feel better. That's Hollywood. It's a movie. It actually is not true, because there are plenty of studies that show that when you get people angry, and you have half the group punch the pillow and think of the person who angered them, and half the group just think of the person who angered them without punching the pillow, then the people who punch the pillow end up feeling much more angry than the other people, much more aggressive afterwards than the other people, and much more likely to take out that aggression on innocent bystanders around them, say like friends and family. So that catharsis model is wrong. You know, we have, <laughs> we still have psychologists who have in their office the plastic bats and, and, and the human forms. And there was once, this was quite a few years ago, but I, I was observing a session. <laughs> there was a seven-year-old bruiser with a plastic bat smashing this figure while the therapist was cooing on the side and going, yes, you're very angry at daddy. And I'm like, ooh, I feel like issuing a warning to daddy about what happens when that kid gets home. That's not helpful. It doesn't work, the catharsis theory. But the other thing that happens is the more you ruminate, the more you think about the angering or the upsetting event, the more likely you are to want to think about it. You're increasing the urge to ruminate about it. You're increasing the likelihood of it popping into your head unbidden. And you're feeling very, very, you know, that it's very important that you think it through. That's what you're actually doing. And you're making it a little addictive. It can become like heroin. It just keeps appearing and you have to think about it and you have to, heroin without the high. So really, and, 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 and it's very, very difficult to stop because it's more and more and more and you're not aware you're doing something that's damaging. Our insides are telling us this is important to think through, but there is no thinking through. We're just replaying like hamsters caught in this emotional wheel that doesn't go anywhere. And the other thing it does is it actually impairs are problem solving over time. Because we are spending so much time stewing instead of doing. We're spending so much time thinking of all the problems without how to solve them, that we are getting used to not being able to solve problems. Here's a, uh, an unfortunate uh, study that they did. They looked at women who found a lump in their breast. 
And they divided the, the group of women into women who had a tendency to ruminate and women who did not have a tendency to ruminate. And the women who had a tendency to ruminate waited on average two months longer to make an appointment with their doctor after finding a lump in their breast. Two months after finding a lump. Because they were so used to just worrying and stewing and not doing, they weren't used to doing. So it impairs our problem solving. It makes us more passive. And it predisposes us to depression. Why? Because think of how much stage time is caught up with the bad thing, the upsetting thing, the angering thing, the thing that made you feel victimized and bad and weak and small. You're, it's so much stage time, that's what you're coloring your world as. Negative, upsetting, angering. So it, predis it predisposes you to depression. It predisposes you to eating disorders because we manage our feelings with food a lot of the time. And it predisposes us to alcohol because if you're going to get so irritable all the time, you need to take the edge off at the, edge, at the end of the day. And people can literally develop problems because of it. And you're releasing such a chronic amount of, of, of stress hormones into your bloodstream that people who have a tendency to um, ruminate and to brood are at much, much higher risk for cardiovascular disease over time. So that's something we really, really need to not do. So how do you not do? Let's say you're caught up in that cycle. Let's say the thing happened, you're upset, you're caught up in the cycle. How do you not do it? Well, the idea is don't think about it. But it's easier said than done. We know that efforts to not think about something, thought suppression, doesn't work. Famous study that was done many decades ago uh, was with a white bear. Uh, it was done in Texas. I don't know why they said white bear. But they had people in a room, they put them by a bell, and they said, here's your task. For five minutes, you may not think about a white bear. But if you do, ring the bell. Ding, ding. It, was like, it was like some kind of festival in that room with a bell. <laughs> and not just that, the minute the five minutes were up, all the people could think of was a stupid white bear. So the thought suppression doesn't work. You actually have to put your mind onto something else, something compelling. You have to use a distraction that requires concentration. And so it can be anything that requires concentration. It can be, um, you know, like a crossword puzzle. It can be a memory task, like trying to remember the order of seating in your high school class, the order of books on your shelf at home, the order of songs on a playlist. One of the ones they use in the literature for some reason is the, the order of groceries in your supermarket aisle. Uh, but anything like that. Turns out that even two minutes of a distraction that takes you away from that obsessive thought is enough to break the, the spell of it. And so you actually have to think of this when you're caught in that cycle like a real habit-changing program. The same way you would if you were trying to quit smoking. You do know the urges and the cravings will come fast and furious at first and get weaker as time goes on if you can resist them. Same deal. You have to have a zero tolerance policy. You have to catch the thought as soon as you can. And sometimes it'll be at the beginning. Sometimes it'll have already played out. As soon as you can, you catch it. Don't wonder, should I distract? Why am I thinking about this now? I'm supposed to not be thinking about it. What's wrong with me? No, no, no. None of that. Straight to the distraction. Two, three minutes, and then go on with your day. It comes up again, straight to the distraction. Don't think through, well, why? And I thought I was trying. No, none of it. Just straight to the distraction. And really avoid the temptation if you've done that and you rid yourself of that obsessive thought and two months later you bump into a colleague who used to work with that boss, don't catch them up on what happened with the boss. Because that will be like being off cigarettes for two months and going, let me just have a little drag now. No, no, no. It just reactivates the whole thing. So avoid it. Because it's really, really important to really disrupt that cycle and not fall into the ruminating uh, pattern. What I suggest is make a list ahead of time of distractions that work for you and carry it with you so you can check your list and I'm going to think about this now. Really two minutes is all it takes. It's a worthwhile investment. All right, let's look at one last example of a psychological injury and we're going to look at guilt. I consider guilt to be the poison in our system. And you'll see why, because guilt poisons not just our minds in a way, but our relationships as well. We tend to feel a lot of guilt, much, much more than we realize. One study found that in short bursts of mild guilt, we can experience up to two and a half hours a day 
of mild guilt, up to five hours a week of moderate guilt, and up to three and a half hours a month of severe guilt. Well, people say, really, that much? How come? And I said, well, think about it. You're sitting at work, and you're like, it's my mother's birthday. I forgot to call. I really have to remember to call. Ten minutes pass. Oh, I really have to remember to call my mother. Let me do it right after this meeting. Oh, I have to go into another meeting? I have to remember. It's like a snooze alarm, right, that keeps reminding you of, of what you need to do. And in that sense, guilt is like a lot of psychological constructs. Too little of it, not so good. A moderate amount, good. Too much of it, not so good. Because guilt has an important function. It preserves our relationships. It lets us know when we've done or are about to do something that can harm another person. And it allows us to not do the thing we were thinking of doing or to try and correct it, atone for it, take responsibility and apologize. So it's like a superhero. It swoops in and says, no, 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 no. That relationship is important. Do something about it. But when the guilt is excessive, when it's unrelenting, when it's unresolved, it's like a snooze alarm that doesn't stop going off even when you're awake. It's just signaling in your brain over and over and over again. It is extraordinarily distracting. And guilt can be extremely, extremely distracting. It is a huge mental and emotional drain. It's actually an emotional burden. But the burden, turns out, is not just emotional. They did a study in which they divided people into two groups. They said to one group, we'd like you to recall a time where you did something really ethical. And they said to the other group, we would like you to recall a time where you did something really unethical. And they had them write about it. So they made one group of people feel guilty. And then they said to them, you know, people's weight tends to fluctuate. We'd like you to estimate how much your current weight is relative to normal. And the people who were made to feel guilty estimated themselves to weigh much more than the guilt who wasn't made to feel guilty. In other words, the actual burden of guilt literally made them feel weighed down. And even further, they then said to them, we would like you to estimate how much effort it takes to do certain pro-social activities, like helping a disabled person up the stairs with their groceries or their laundry. And the people who were made to feel guilty estimated that it would take much more effort to do that pro-social task than the people who didn't feel guilty because they were burdened. They felt weighed down, literally. It's another way in which it really impacted how they felt physically. And so what happens to us uh, when we're guilty is that we tend to try and manage the guilt in both conscious and unconscious ways. In one study, they gave college students, this is how they, they do uh, guilt in some of the college studies. They'll put people in front of a computer and they'll tell them we well, are playing a game with a partner against two other people. Obviously, as you've now figured out, the partner's fake, the two other people don't exist, but they tell them that and then they tell them at the end, ah, you know, you did well in that game, but the way you played, only you get the prize, not your partner. And the prize was going to be a few lottery tickets. So we're talking about a cheap prize, which probably is worth nothing. So they say that. And then they have them wait in another room where, coincidentally, oh, yeah, that's your partner who didn't get the, you know, the, the, the tickets. So they make them feel guilty, and they make them look at the person who they deprived of the lottery tickets, who obviously is a research assistant who's sitting there scowling. And then they say to them, now you can choose um, your, your reward for participating in the study. Now, people who are not made to feel guilty chose CDs and DVDs and fun things. And what did the people who were made to feel guilty choose? Uh, pens and uh, notebooks and school supplies, not, not fun things. Because when we feel guilty, we don't feel entitled to enjoy life. And that's a very small example of it. But we don't. We don't. When you feel really guilty about something, when you did miss your mother's birthday, or when you did something that really hurt your friend's feelings, and people say, oh, let's go out and have fun, you're like, ah, I don't think I feel like having fun. And we really don't feel that way. But what happens is, the unconscious guilt management, it's not just about that it prevents us from enjoying life, it actually makes us adopt self-punishment in all kinds of unconscious ways. Think of the experiment with the lottery tickets. They did a version of it in which they said to the people who had the horrible sin of depriving an unknown person of lottery tickets, and they said to them, they're going to be in the waiting room, and we just wanted to see if you'd be willing to do something to express your remorse. And they said, sure, what? And they said, well, there's a little contraption there where you put your hand and there's a switch, and if you flick the switch, it'll give you an uncomfortable electrical shock. Would you be willing to do that? 
And they said, well, let me see. And they go out there and put their hand in the thing, and there's a switch, and the research assistant is sitting there scowling of being deprived of their lottery tickets, and way more people than not flip the switch. They're willing to give themselves an uncomfortable electrical shock for depriving somebody they don't know of lottery tickets that probably aren't worth anything in the first place. Now, I want to be very clear. There was no electrical shock because, you know, the point of it is not to electrocute the volunteers. The point of it is to see if they would flip the switch. So once they flipped the switch, we didn't need them to, you know, to have the zap. So there is a humane-ish aspect to these kinds of studies. So just wanted to be very, very clear about that. So, um, and so, you know, there's, and, and you know what they call this? You know, they, they call this tendency to self-punish. They recently gave it a name, and they called it the Doby effect. And does anyone know why? Harry Potter. There's a, an elf in the Harry Potter movies who's a self-punishing elf. He smacks his head against the wall because Doby's a bad elf. That's what they called the uh, phenomena. Um, so anyway, so, and then the last thing is that when we feel guilty, instead of repairing the relationship, we tend to avoid. Because what happens is, we'll usually apologize. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't make your birthday party to our good friend whose party we missed. And they'll say, well, you know, okay, I understand. You had a bad day at work, whatever. Um, but then the tension remains, you know. And over time, that tension is still there, and we feel uncomfortable. And every time we see the friend, it reminds us that we really did something we're not very proud of. So we start not seeing the friend as much and not going to those social gatherings where the friend is there. And it happens in families, and then the families can kind of coalesce on the two sides of the, the person who did the thing and the person who didn't do the thing. And over time, we actually start to avoid the person who's making us feeling guilty, not consciously, but unconsciously. We'll find excuses, and that relationship gets frayed and frayed and frayed. And that's why I was saying earlier that guilt can really poison our relationships. Now, let's look at a solution for guilt. It is astonishing, but the vast majority of the time, what actually does happen is our apology sucked. Because where we are with apologies is roughly where we were at age five. At age five, we were told, you must say sorry, fine, I'm sorry, you're forgiven, and on we go. And that's kind of where we are. We'll say sorry, maybe with a little bit less attitude, but that's the level of sophistication our apologies have. And unfortunately, psychologists aren't much better. Up until very re recently, when they studied apologies and forgiveness, the question was, was an apology rendered? Check. Or apology not rendered? Check. What kind of apology? Was it effective? What might have made it effective? No one cared. But recently, they did start looking at that. And it turns out that there are six ingredients an effective apology should have. And just to remind you, an apology has one goal in mind, not the five-year-old goal of just saying it. The goal of an apology is to garner authentic forgiveness from the other person. It's the only goal. And so how do you get the authentic forgiveness? Well, you know, in my book, I go through all the six ingredients and give case studies about each one and the missing ingredients. But I want to mention one of the ingredients. It's the one I consider the most important, primarily because it's the one we tend to omit most often. And it's also the one that has the most active ingredient in terms of eliciting the authentic forgiveness. And that is an empathy statement. If we want the other person to really forgive us, we have to be able to convey that we get what happened to them, not from our point of view, from their point of view. So yes, you can, you can lavish, which is what we tend to do, the explanation of how I had a terrible day at work, you see, and, and my boss did this, you see, and so when I got home, I just felt so not up to it. Surely you understand why I didn't show up to your party, even though you're my best friend. But that doesn't say to the other person that we get what we did to them. What would say what, that we get what we did to them is that if we said to them, look, I'm really sorry I didn't come and you're my best friend, I'm sure you were standing there all night thinking, where am I? Why am I not showing? And I know how much effort you put into this party and how important it was for you. And I'm sure other people must have come up to you and say, hey, where am I? And you didn't even know what to say, which is probably embarrassing as well as annoying. And so I probably ruined your party for you. I wouldn't be surprised if I really ruined the party for you after all the effort you put into it, and I am so, so sorry that I did that. I realize that's what must have happened. I feel terrible. Now, it's difficult to own that. It's difficult to be that responsible and to really own it. But if the relationship is important, if we really want to garner that authentic forgiveness, yes, 
We actually have to be adults and convey to the other person, I'm willing, I'm aware of the implications. And when we hear that on the receiving end, it is so much easier for us to go, you know what, I'm so glad you get it, and to forgive. And once they forgive, our guilt will dissolve. But that's what it takes. That's the active ingredient and the ingredient that we forget all the time. So let's look at how psychological injuries damage our emotions and our moods and our perceptions and our thinking and our cognition and our behavior, which then leads them to damage our relationships. And they damage our mental health in the short term and in the long term and our emotional well-being, and as we've seen in many ways, our physical health, which is pretty much everything. Psychological injuries can impact our lives. Now look, I'm not saying that everything needs to be treated in that way because we can get a nick and we can get a sniffle. We're not running to the doctor for every sniffle. We're not bandaging every nick. But the ones that bother us, the ones that matter, the ones that don't go away, we actually have to do something about. And we don't. I want to use one more example to show you about how to treat a psychological injury. I started with, and I want to get back to rejection, because that's so common. I want to show you how to deal with that. I said that when it comes to psychological injuries, we often don't even know that we're injured. Not so much with rejection, because as we said, it really hurts. So if you ask people, how do you typically respond when you get rejected? What's your typical response? Here's what people say. One of the first things that people will say is, how people typically respond, is they get a little bit angry and aggressive. Um, this is uh, <laughs> fatal attraction, anyone? Do you remember the Glenn Close thing? This is after she boiled the bunny. And um, so, yeah, we get a little bit angry and we get a little bit aggressive. But the most common thing we do when I say to people, what do you do when you get rejected? What's the first word people shout out? Vodka! So yes, it's alcohol. But it turns out when you stuff your feelings down with alcohol, they just come back up again. So, and then the last thing we typically do is we try to drown our sorrows with food by hugging the dessert plate, emotional overeating, while someone stands over us with a supportive hand on our shoulder. So, needless to say, these don't work that well. Thing is that rejection injures us in a variety of ways. But one of the most important things we have to do to recover is to revive our feeling of self-worth. Our self-esteem just took it between the legs, if you know what I'm saying. But the problem is that when our self-esteem takes a blow, when our self-esteem is low, the thing that does the most damage to it is us. Because once we got rejected, here's what we do. We'll start to be self-critical and we'll self-blame and we'll list all our faults and all our deficiencies. Well, you know, if I was taller or blonder or smarter or richer and I'm such a loser and I'm such an idiot and this always happens to me, we literally savage our self-esteem when it's already low. We started off with an injury that's this big and then we make it this big. And it's not just our self-esteem. The majority of our psychological wounds are self-inflicted. We would never do that with a physical wound. You would never get a cut and go, oh, I'm going to put salt in it, and I'm going to see if I can expand it a little bit. Or, oh, I'm feeling terrible, I have a cold and a fever. This would be the good time to go outside in the cold weather without a coat. We, we, that wouldn't, oh, I sprained my ankle, let me do the marathon tomorrow. It would never occur to us in the physical realm. We do it psychologically all the time. We become self-critical when our self-esteem is low. We psych ourselves out after a failure. I have a big chapter on failure in the book. We don't have time for it today, but we constantly psych ourselves out afterwards. We push people away from us when we're lonely. We indulge the urge to brood and to ruminate when it's really bad for us, and we distance ourselves when we're feeling guilty instead of actually trying to repair the relationship. So we do so much self-damage when it comes to, uh, to our psychology, which again would be unfathomable to us if our injuries uh, were physical. So now back to self-esteem. Um, when we're nurturing our self-esteem back to health, it's extremely important that we think of it as nurturing our self-esteem back to health. Because self-esteem is really important. What we know is that when our self-esteem is higher, we are more resilient to things like rejection and failure 
and anxiety and stress, when we encounter them, they bother us less, they hurt us less, and we recover from them more quickly. And in that way, self-esteem is like an emotional immune system, and low self-esteem is like having a weak emotional immune system. And if you think of it that way, as your self-esteem as being an emotional immune system, you would think of that's something we would want to strengthen. You know, our self-esteem is the armor that we wear to life. It protects us from the slings and arrows that we encounter in life. Who would think of poking holes in their own armor before going out to battle? But we do that when it comes to our self-esteem. We are that critical. And it's a real, real problem. So how do we revive our self-worth? The most popular self-esteem uh, technique, program, if you will, on the market today is positive affirmations. Positive affirmations are statements such as, uh, I'm attractive and worthy of great love, or I'm going to be a great success, or every day I'm getting better and better. You've all heard them, you've seen them on refrigerator magnets and on calendars and at the bottom of annoying emails. You see them all the time around you. But what happens, oh, and in subliminal tapes, which you listen to at night, even though you're not comprehending them. And by the way, people once came into my office with, I have a program of positive affirmations. Here are the subliminal tapes. And I'm like, then they're subliminal. Why are the messages on the packaging? Because, all right. So the point is, when we do research on positive affirmations, we find something interesting. They work for one group of people. People with high self-esteem. <laughs> People with low self-esteem, not only it doesn't help them, they actually feel worse after doing it. Now, why would that be? Why would it be that if your self-esteem is low, telling yourself that your great and wonderful things will happen will actually make you feel worse? Well, if we look at persuasion theory, we know that if a statement falls within the boundaries of our belief system, we will accept it. But if it falls too far outside the boundaries of our belief system, we can't accept it. And when you're feeling fundamentally unattractive and unhopeful of finding love after one rejection after the other, sitting there and telling yourself, I'm really beautiful, I will find great love, is not going to convince you. And your unconscious mind is going to reject that statement and remind you why it does, because actually, you're not that hot. And so it's, it's going to make you feel worse. And, and the irony that these things only work for the people who don't need them, and our worst for the people who do is really upsetting, but that is the reality. It's found in research over and over and over again. And yet, there are the refrigerator magnets all around us. I feel like plucking them off. Anyway, but the point is, how do you revive your self-esteem then? Well, affirmation is important, but the kind of affirmation you have to use is a different kind of affirmation. It's a self-affirmation. You have to affirm aspects of yourself you know you own you know are true, abilities and qualities you actually know you have that you actually think are valuable. And so here's the exercise I want you to do in these situations, when you feel rejected, when you failed, when your self-esteem is low, when you're not feeling good about yourself, here's the exercise you need to do. It is domain specific. So if it's about dating, you do it one way, I'll give you the examples. If it's about work and employment or friendship, you do something else. But let's say dating as an example. I want you to make a list of as many qualities and attributes you can think of that you know you have, that you know are valuable in relationships, that are valuable to the other person. And when I suggest this to people, they sometimes say, well, there's nothing. And I'm like, really, nothing about you whatsoever that's redeeming. No, there's nothing. I'm like, all right, are you loyal in relationships? Well, yeah, I'm loyal. Are you a good listener? Well, yeah, I'm a good listener. Are you supportive of your partner's endeavors? Yeah, I'm supportive. Are you emotionally available? Yeah, most, anyway, you can come up with a very long list of attributes that you have. And if it's in the work sphere, are you punctual? Are you responsible? Are you a team player? Are you motivated? Etc. Etc. Make a long list and then choose one of those items and write a brief essay about it. Two paragraphs, say, in which you describe why the value or the attribute is important, why it's valued by other people, how you've expressed it in the past that has been valued by other people, or how you might express it in the future in a way that's been valuable to other people. 
and write that essay. Because what you're doing when you do that is you are affirming aspects of yourself you know you have. You are reminding yourself of what your worth truly is, what you bring to the table. Instead of focusing on what you don't have, you're focusing on what you do. And that will really revive your self-esteem. Now, sometimes people will say to me, I tried it, it doesn't work. And I'm like, you, you made the list and you wrote the essay? Yeah, in my head. I'm like, all right. It's like me saying, you know, I was hungry and I thought of all the food I had in my refrigerator and how I would cook it, but I'm still hungry. <laughs> Making the list is like the cooking. And the writing the essay is like the eating. Writing is one of the ways we absorb messages psychologically. You can't skip it and do it in your head. Because when you're writing, you're using so many different areas of your brain that it's the way we absorb the message. So you can't skip the actual writing of this task. But do it every day if your self-esteem is feeling low. Do it before you go out on a date. Do it before your job interview. Do it before you're going to meet the new friends you're a little anxious about meeting. Remind yourself what your worth is. And this exercise has been shown to be extremely, extremely effective. So that's one of the things you can do when you experience a rejection. So the benefits of practicing emotional first aid are that it eases our emotional pain, which to me is the most important benefit in the short term. But it also restores our cognitive function. It allows us to think straight in the moment. When we're obsessing about something and ruminating, our thought process gets scrambled. That two minutes can restore it of the distraction. It minimizes the risk of the infection, of things getting worse, of injuries accumulating and impacting us down the road. It minimizes the risk to our physical health. It can salvage and enhance our relationships, and it can increase our emotional resilience. And so to me, the whole idea here is that if we're talking about a healthy lifestyle, if we're talking about a way that we want to really make ourselves the best we can be and as healthy as we can be, we cannot not include the psychological component. We have to be able to catch up. You know, I was so impressed with Dr. Campbell, I kind of feel the way he did around 1974. You know, where it's like, really, no one knows this at all? No one's paying attention? Even the professionals, no one's paying attention? No one is paying attention. You don't hear this kind of discourse about psychological health. Like I said, you ask someone, how's your psychological health? And they look at you like you just insulted them. So we need to close that gap. We need to start thinking. And really, I'm not making you evangelist. Do it for yourself. Do it for you. Don't ignore your psychological health. Don't ignore your emotional health. Invite Cinderella to the ball. She'll thank you. So will Freud. But I'm, I'm saying it will be a really important thing. You'll really feel the difference in your life. Teach it to your children. Let's raise a generation of kids who actually think about their emotional health and do something about it. You know, an eight-year-old is so proud when they go and they bandage their own arm with a band-aid. Look, I cut myself, I put it on. Teach them how to deal with some of these very common and daily things. All right, so I hope the next time you experience a, a psychological injury of whatever kind, you don't just ignore it, you don't just hurt, but you really think about what's happening to you and you apply emotional first aid. Thank you very much. Um, I have a 16-year-old daughter who, when you put up the very first slide, every single one of those she faces on a daily basis. And um, I was wondering if this book is something that I could give to her, if it's, um, if it's, beyond counseling, and she's gone to counseling, but doesn't respond as well as I feel that your words would help her respond. Um, I'm just wondering if it's appropriate for somebody her age, or if it's more of an adult text, or, um, or it is, is it a slow-going process? I mean, really, every single chapter would be something that, that she would have to deal with on that basis, but the application is just so so profound and perfect for her personality. No, I, I think that it is something a 16-year-old can absorb. The question is whether she would want to. The way I would pitch it to her is, the, the way my book works, each chapter is divided into two sections. The first section goes into, well, this is what happens to us. Here are the studies. Here's how we, here's the injuries we get. And the second part of the chapter is, and here are the treatments. And this one will fit that, and this one will take care of this. 
tell her that you heard this talk, that you wanted her to read about what happens to us just so she understands that her experience is not uncommon. And tell her, you can skip the treatments, you don't have to do that. Often when you tell teenagers they don't have to do something, they do it. But, you know, but tell her she doesn't have to do that, but you just wanted her to have an understanding because this is, it's all based on a lot of research, there are references at the end, it's usually pretty current research. So tell her it's really great to understand what's happening to us, what the research tells us. It might just be something for you to read so you understand what's going on. And then you can ignore the second half if you want. But that might be a pitch she'll absorb, I don't, I don't know. <laughs>